Next, a House hearing on the financial and operational challenges facing the U.S. Postal Service. Witnesses include Robert Bernstock, president of shipping and mailing for the service. On Tuesday, the Postal Service announced a 3% price increase in priority mail shipping for the next year, while the price for first class and standard mail will remain the same. This oversight committee hearing is an hour and 45 minutes. Good morning and welcome. The Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service in the District of Columbia hearing will now come to order. I want to welcome my colleague and friend, Ranking Member Chaffetz and members of the Subcommittee hearing, witnesses and all those in attendance. In attendance. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine what steps the Postal Service has taken and plans to take uh, since Congress passed the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, PIEA, I'll try to keep the acronyms to, to a minimum, uh, to use its increased flexibility to grow revenue. Furthermore, we are here to discuss barriers or limitations to the Postal Service's innovations. and what lessons can be learned from foreign posts in this area. The chair, ranking member, and the subcommittee each will have five minutes to make an opening statement, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will yield myself such time, well, five minutes for my opening statement. Uh, in the series of hearings the subcommittee has held on the Postal Service thus far this year, the discussion has tended to focus on the Postal Service's bottom line or its cost-cutting and consolidation efforts, and rightfully so, as the past two fiscal years have presented some significant financial challenges for the nation's mail system. However, today the subcommittee convenes not to discuss what the Postal Service has been doing to reduce expenditures, but more so to learn about the organization, what the organization is doing to grow revenue and the overall value of mail as part of an ongoing effort to bring about fiscal turnaround. Today, almost three years since the passage and enactment of the landmark Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, we look forward to hearing what exactly has been done to grow the business under the new price flexibilities and product innovations afforded to the Postal Service in 2006. First, however, I must briefly acknowledge the financial reality before us. The Postal Service expects a net loss of approximately $7 billion for fiscal year 2009 prior to accounting for the recent legislation in the form of a $4 billion deferred payment to the Retiree Health Benefit Fund. I am pleased Congress was able to grant the Postal Service Authority to defer a share of its retiree health benefits prepayment, which allowed the organization to meet its financial obligations and improve its cash position. However, as my friends from both sides of the aisle acknowledged last month the relief measure was only a temporary solution to a host of long-term problems. Moreover, I would like to note that this was not a bailout. Many Americans think the Postal Service is largely supported by federal government dollars. It is not. This is an important point I want to stress. The Postal Service is over 99 percent self-supporting, with less than 1 percent of its funds provided by the federal government to support important things like mail for the blind and overseas voting. Again, that's less than 1 percent. Additionally, up until postal reform, the Postal Service operated under the so-called break-even mandate, preventing the organization from even making a profit. Post PAEA, the <laughs> let me, I'm trying to stay away from these, uh, these acronyms. The Postal Accountability and, what is it again? Enhancement Act. Uh, however, the Postal Service is now permitted to operate more like a business in terms of profit, earning, and product diversification. To that end, I look forward to hear hearing from today's witnesses on the extent to which the Postal Service has attempted to grow its business, from the novel summer sale to the offering of flat rate boxes and holiday greeting cards. Today's hearing is intended to examine the steps that the Postal Service has taken and the results achieved so far in the area. 
In looking to the future, Post Postmaster General Jack Potter recently described several initiatives the Postal Service is potentially interested in to diversify and grow revenue. He observed that the Postal Service has more retail outlets in the United States than McDonald's, Starbucks and Walmart combined. Perhaps surprisingly to some, he proposed that the Postal Service should be permitted to offer its customers alternate services such as banking, insurance and telecommunications. Given past experiences and the extreme caution required when en enterprising a business, I am interested in hearing the extent to which these newly proposed ideas have been vetted as well as what risks have been evaluated. Uh, further, I have asked today's witnesses to address what lessons can be learned from foreign posts in the area of product and service development and diversification. I know that some foreign posts, such as those in Japan and France, offer banking services and sell mobile phones, for example. However, I also know that several countries have privatized their postal services, while the U.S. Postal Service remains an independent federal establishment of the United States Government. In the coming months, our subcommittee will continue to provide close oversight of the Postal Service, including an in-depth examination of the Postal Service's business model to help determine which longer-term changes are necessary to help the Postal Service return to financial viability. The Postal Service undoubtedly needs to move forward with its efforts to grow its revenue and increase the value of mail, perhaps even more so than focusing on cutting costs or reduce its retiree health benefit obligations. I thank each of you for being with us this morning. I look forward to your participation, and I yield for five minutes to the Ranking, ranking Member, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for uh, uh, agreeing to, to hold this uh, very important uh, discussion. Uh, my, my comments will be brief because we came to listen and hear uh, from this panel. But let me just concur and echo the sentiments uh, as the Chairman uh, articulated because uh, I think he has it uh, exactly right. Uh, we will obviously spend time and attention talking about cost-cutting measures, but at the end of the day, we need to increase the relevancy of the United States Postal Service. In order for it to thrive and to serve the, the, the citizens of the United States of America, we need to increase its relevancy. At the same time, I think there needs to be caution in making sure that not, we're not tripping on top of uh, the private sector and maybe with good intentions, maybe some unintended consequences, uh, competing in a space that is probably best left to the private sector. Yet, yet the United States Postal Service under our Constitution uh, has a unique place in, in this country, and uh, I'd like to see us do more. Uh, one of the things in particular that I think we should pay attention to, what is the cross-functionality that we can uh, 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 take advantage of with other segments within government? You know, one, for instance, that I would like to see us continue to pursue is uh, the conducting of the United States Census, uh, something we do every 10 years. Uh, they are given $14 billion in order to execute it. We have real estate. We have very, very able people. Again, something that I think we should continue to pursue. What are the things that we can do with FEMA? What are the things we can do with other government agencies that need the types of resources that are uniquely provided by the United States Postal Service? So I look forward to your comments. I appreciate the, the Chairman's approach on this as well. And I hope this is the start of a series of dialogues about the potential impact and the potential uh, new openings and increased relevancy for the United States Postal Service. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you. I know the gentleman has re uh, recently arrived. Uh, I would like at this point to yield five minutes to the gentleman from North, North Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thanks for holding this hearing on the long-term viability of the Postal Service. Uh, this is precisely the type of process we should be conducting in order to determine those changes that will enable the Postal Service to thrive in the future. In general, we should be wary of short-term cost-cutting measures that could reduce Postal Service market share and revenue in the future, such as a shift, for example, to five-day mail delivery. Instead, it would be preferable, from my point of view, to examine changes that enable the Postal Service to augment its existing sources of revenue. I am pleased the Postal Service is examining 15 new revenue sources that could complement mail service. These changes should not be limited to marginal changes. For example, perhaps it would be possible for the Postal Service to work in partnership with community banks to integrate banks and post offices in a manner that would help both existing community banks and the Postal Service itself. The goal of exploring these new revenue options should be to preserve the outstanding services offered by the Postal Service. We all benefit from affordable and convenient mail delivery. 
The ability of the Postal Service to deliver mail quickly in six days of the week not only protects our constituents' quality of life, but also creates opportunity for businesses that rely on mail for advertising of product distribution. If the Postal Service did not exist, there is little doubt that the mailing market would have oligopolistic, olig like an oligopoly, uh, characteristics with negative implications for affordability and consumer choice. The Postal Service continues to play an important role limiting the prices of sending mail and packages, which helps all consumers. The Postal Service also makes an important contribution to our economy. Approximately 615,000 people work for the Postal Service, generally earning high union wages, or fairly high union wages. During the Bush administration, for the first time in history, median wages for American families actually fell during an eco a full economic cycle of expansion, recession, and recovery. Protecting high-paying blue-collar jobs, such as those provided by the Postal Service, must be part of our broader efforts to help the economy recover. Thanks again, Chairman Lynch, for holding this important series of hearings on the long-term viability of the Postal Service, and I look forward to hearing from our panel. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I, too, thank you for holding this critically important uh, hearing on adapting the Postal Service to our changing world. The United States Postal Service is the second largest civilian employer with approximately 623,000 career employees. Although consumers rank the Post Office as one of the most trusted government agencies and it continues to excel, the Post Office has not been immune to the downward economic trends currently facing our nation. While final numbers are not available yet, it is estimated that the Post Office will experience a $6.2 billion loss, which is over two times more than last year's loss. This loss can be attributed to largely to two factors. Number one, the unprecedented decline in mail volume due to increased use of electronic communications and other factors and two, the economic recession that is affecting all sectors. The Postal Service has been making a number of aggressive cost-cutting measures, but I am interested in hearing about the new innovative ideas our panelists will present today. The Postal Accountability Enhancement Act was signed into law in December of 2006, allowing for flexibility in how services are designed, priced, and marketed. Because of that flexibility, the Post Office has been able to create new innovative programs, such as the Standard Mail Volume Incentive Pricing Program this past summer. The summer sale provided a 30 percent rebate to eligible mailers on letters volume above a specific threshold. This program is estimated to have generated at least $50 million in sales. The Postal Service has also restructured its website and created mobile device functionality for its customers. This allows greater accessibility and added convenience for postal users. For 44 cents, we can send a letter anywhere in the United States. We all would have to admit that is a pretty good bargain. The Post Office is and continues to be reliable and a great value. I look forward to the discussion today about expanding services and non-postal products directly or in partnership with private sector entities and what Congress can do to help the United States Postal Service. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank you. Yeah. The Chair now recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. For five thank, minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me just echo the sentiments that have already been expressed by my colleagues in thanking you for calling this hearing. I think that the Postal Service is one of those critical elements of our communication system that must be seriously addressed. And so I am eager to hear an analysis of the impact of the efforts that have been put forth by Postmaster General Potter and his staff 
and the other entities associated with trying to make sure that we maintain the viability of our postal operation. When I think of what we are facing with the impact of electronic communication and all of the other economic indicators that are upon us, we recognize that it is no easy task and that there are no simple solutions to very complex issues. But I want to commend you for your leadership as chairman of this subcommittee and how you have been moving things along to try and help assure that our postal operations will continue as viable instruments of our communication system. So I want to thank you very much and look forward to hearing the witnesses. I thank the gentleman for his kind words. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, it's the custom of this subcommittee to swear its witnesses before they provide testimony. May I invite you to stand and please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that all of the witnesses, each of the witnesses has answered in the affirmative. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just offer brief introductions of our, our, our panel of witnesses. Mr. Robert Bernstock was named President of Mailing and Shipping Services, a new division at the U.S. Postal Service in June 2008. He is responsible for development and management of all retail and commercial products for the Postal Service, including commercial sales and services. Mr. Bernstock has extensive senior leadership experience with Campbell Soup Company, Scott's miracle Grow, and Vlasic Foods, among others. The Honorable Ruth Goldway was designated chairman of the U.S. Postal Regulatory Commission by President Barack Obama on August 6, 2009, and has served with the agency since 1998. She is an experienced regulatory and public affairs professional with expertise in citizen participation, consumer issues, urban planning issues, as well as the mailing industry. Mr. Michael Coughlin is a recent retiree from Accenture, a global consulting technology and outsourcing firm where he helped to manage senior level relationships with postal clients around the world. Mr. Coughlin also spent 32 years with the United States Postal Service serving as Deputy Postmaster General and member of the Board of Governors from 1987 to 1999. Mr. Phil Hare is Director of the Physical Infrastructure Team at the Government Accountability Office. Since joining GAO in 1989, he has managed reviews of broad range, a broad range of domestic and international concerns. His current portfolio focuses on programs at the Postal Service and the Department of Transportation. Mr. Robert Reisner is President and CEO of Transformation Strategies and has been a management consultant for more than 20 years, specializing in strategic market transformation. He has previously served in the executive positions at the Postal Service, including Vice President for Strategic Planning from 1996 to 2001. We'll now begin uh, witness testimony. Mr. Bernstock, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Bernstock, could you pull that microphone a little closer to you? Thank you. Like Sir, I think I think that your folder is blocking the. Uh, you can if you can pull that forward a little bit. All right, that should make go. a big difference. <laughs> um, should I begin again, or just uh, right up to your mouth here. whatever? You Take it from the top. All right, here we go. <laughs> See what happens with the microphone on. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate your interest in the revenue generation activities of the Postal Service, as that is the primary focus of my work. I would like to begin by recognizing Congress's active support of the Postal Service this year, especially your understanding of the urgency behind changing the retiree health benefit payment structure for fiscal year 2009. The Postal Service continues to face severe financial challenges. Our auditors are currently reviewing our fiscal year 2009 financials, and while I cannot give you the precise figures, I can say that despite heroic cost reductions of over $6 billion, we expect our mail volume to decline by approximately 26 billion pieces with a net loss of over $7 billion 
prior to accounting for recent legislation. There is no certainty that mail volume levels will recover or if they will continue to decline to be replaced with other forms of communication. But we are certain that without significant changes, the potential exists for similarly large financial losses in the foreseeable future. We are actively engaged in a four-pronged effort to correct Postal Service finances. The first and most obvious approach is to continue to aggressively bring down our costs. The Postal Service has set very aggressive cost reduction targets. A change in delivery frequency from six days to five days and modification of retiree health benefit fund payments are both integral elements of the second strategy. The third and fourth paths are the subject of today's hearings. To be equally aggressive in our efforts to grow revenue within the law and to change the law to provide greater product and pricing flexibility. An example of how we utilized our pricing freedoms enabled by the Postal Act is a standard mail summer sale. Working with the PRC, we developed the summer sale offering a 30 percent price discount on incremental volume on advertising mail for three months over this summer. We are still evaluating this program, but preliminary information suggests that over 400 of our largest customers participated and mailed a significant number of incremental pieces of standard mail to help stimulate the economy. I would like to give special thanks to the PRC for its quick and thorough review of this proposal. The summer sale, along with other revenue generating initiatives that, that I describe in some detail in my written testimony, like the Priority Mail Advertising Campaign, Priority Mail Contract Pricing, and Consumer Products at Retail, including greeting cards, are all underway, already taking advantage of the flexibility avoided, afforded by the Postal Act. Some have already generated incremental revenue, and others are just hitting the marketplace. There are additional initiatives described in my testimony that are still in the planning stages, designed to extend or transform the business by expanding the core capabilities into new business areas. <clears throat> Three examples are first, renewed approaches to the distribution of product samples. Second, the extension of passport processing and enrollment services to secure credentials. And third, the exploration of hybrid mail that is either sent, delivered, or both in digital form. One of the purposes of today's hearings is to examine the constraints that hold the Postal Service back. I outlined specific requests for changes in the postal law in my written testimony, including the authority to provide services to state and local authorities in addition to federal agencies, to provide explicit authority for purely electronic equivalents of the traditional physical services, and to provide more freedoms to leverage our existing assets, especially our retail assets. While I'm excited about our revenue generating projects and the potential for greater freedoms, I want to be clear that revenue alone is not sufficient to close the earnings gap. Even at a 15 percent pre-tax profit margin, it would take profit generated by almost $45 billion in new revenue to fill that earnings gap. The four prongs together are necessary to provide a framework for the Postal Service to be self-sustaining while fulfilling our universal service obligation at service levels the country has come to expect. We are very proud of our accomplishments in meeting the communication and commerce needs of the country. But we recognize that without the help of Congress, we cannot close our significant profitability gap and adequately meet our universal service obligation. I would like to thank the subcommittee for holding this hearing and to reaffirm my personal commitment to working with you to ensure a postal service that meets the mailing and shipping needs of the American public. I would be pleased to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. Ms. Goldway, welcome. You are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chavitz, Congressman Davis, Connolly, and Cummins. Uh, I am pleased to be here today. This subcommittee has a critical role to play in preserving a treasured American asset. The Postal Service is a government agency that connects together every American household, business, and institution through its universal service network. It is a part of our daily life, taken for granted until taken away, part of the fabric of the nation, supporting its educational, political, and charitable institutions. Congress has played a, an ongoing role in revitalizing the postal system, most re recently through the PAEA. The law was designed to preserve the service's historic attributes while providing change for the 21st century. But it was enacted at a time when both the economy and the postal service appeared strong. Now the landscape has changed. I think the PAE is working, but it is hard to see how well, given the recession. There have been clear successes. First, the Commission and the Postal Service have worked together to take advantage of competitive flexibilities in the law 
Through our rate process, the Postal Service has used its pricing power to significantly increase the rate of return on its overall competitive product line. Mr. Bernstock provided the details. Second, this year the Commission approved the Postal Service's first ever request to test seasonal price incentive programs for standard and first class mail, as well as the first and only experimental product submitted under the PAEA. Third, the Postal Service NSA proposals have accelerated under the new law, rising 900 percent in less than three years. Preliminary data on revenue generation activities indicate that overall results have been positive but modest. Since the majority of these efforts involve price discounts, they result in limited additional revenue and provide significantly less contribution to overhead. So while the Commission would like to see more progress being made, particularly in the experimental area, there has been a reasonable effort expended to use the new law. The truth is that the powerful downturn in the economy, which has caused a sharp contraction in key mailing industries like housing, finance and automobiles, would have overwhelmed even the most ambitious of these efforts. There is a tremendous difference between a gradual annual decline of 1 or 2 percent in first class mail, which was the trend addressed by the PAEA, and a 13 percent drop in volume experienced this year. As a result, the Postal Service could not make its payment to the Retiree Health Care Benefit Fund, the RHBF and received $4 billion of relief this year from Congress. And for the immediate future and perhaps some time to come, this situation appears likely to continue. The Postal Service has suggested that it needs additional freedoms modeled on the examples of foreign posts. The Commission is open to considering new perspectives. However, we believe they need to reflect American experience and tradition. My written and testimony includes several examples from foreign posts. There may be some activities that fit the American model but there is no magic bullet. Any new business activity should meet a set of reasonable but specific criteria based on the core mission of the Postal Service, the needs of society, and the expectation of a positive outcome for both. The rationales that others are doing it does not satisfy the criteria. Honestly, the Postal Service has directed most of its management resources toward reducing its costs this year by more than $6 million billion. Cuts continue from adjusting mail routes and renegotiating purchase agreements to removing collection boxes, consolidating plants and closing post offices. Now the Postmaster General is asked to lift the statutory language requiring six-day delivery. The Commission views proposals to reduce service with caution. Service cuts made to address near-term financial difficulties may have harmful long-term consequences for universal service. And from a market perspective, the Postal Service could harm its greatest strategic advantage, its ubiquity. I suggest a better alternative. The Congress may wish to amend the provisions of the PAA that set the RHBF's payments. The annual average payment of $5.5 billion is an enormous burden. The Commission's study of alternate RHBF values found that significantly lower payments by the Postal Service could still meet the original funding objectives of the law. Recalculation would be timely as it would capture the Postal Service's sizable workforce reductions. Further, it would provide breathing room, resources for new initiatives, and some capital investment to enable better long-term planning for the service's future. Looking forward, the Postal Service currently provides a number of non-postal services that could generate new revenue. For example, the Postal Service now processes passports for the State Department. Other federal and state agencies that issue licenses and permits or have retail initiatives could partner with the service as well. The America the Beautiful Access Passes sold by the National Park Service is a partnership I have been advocating in particular. Considering our nation's energy efficient priorities, the Postal Service has the nation's largest civilian vehicle fleet, which could provide the critical mass needed to develop the transformational technologies and infrastructure to meet our national energy goals. Research indicates that postal delivery routes are especially well suited to electric vehicles. A national investment and a new fleet for the Postal Service would speed transformation, add green jobs, and reduce the Postal Service's operational overhead for the foreseeable future. Those of us in the mailing community have confidence in the value of the mail, and it is important to our economy and society. We believe that mail, letter carriers, and post offices serve a rival role in our community. How well the mail comes back, however, may well depend on how deeply service is cut now. That concludes my statement, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coughlin, welcome. You are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, the uh, Chairman did uh, earlier 
just uh, introduce me. I am Michael Coughlin. Uh, I want to make clear I am here not representing any particular organization or group, but I have spent over 40 years uh, in the postal industry. I did spend 32 years with USPS, and for the last 10 years I've, I've been uh, uh, working in a consulting role primarily focused on foreign posts. I've been asked here today to uh, share my perspective on the revenue generation efforts of foreign posts and the lessons we might take from those here in the U.S. My written statement touches on the, on the range of initiatives undertaken by foreign posts and summarizes the varying levels of success that, uh, that some of them have had. I am not going to rehash those here, uh, but let me get right to what I think are the common success factors that uh, some of these posts have, have had in raise, raising uh, alternative revenues and some of the lessons we might glean from them. When I look at, the, uh, at uh, something like 15 different postal organizations around the world and their revenue generation efforts. Uh, I see four kind of common management characteristics among the more successful of those, uh, at least in their rev uh, revenue raising uh, efforts. Those four characteristics include real clarity around strategic direction and a narrow focus on the markets and segments that they want to target. They know what they want to do and they do it. There is a strong innovation agenda in these organizations and a forward-looking culture that embraces change. In those organizations, innovation is an expectation. The posts, these posts generally have the ability to recruit top talent. Many of the key players, particularly on the revenue generation side, come from outside the traditional postal experience. And one other common factor among them is they tend to focus uh, when they undertake these initiatives on the customer experience and making that as positive as possible. Whatever these, the successful posts set out to do, they strive to do it better than the competition. Now, these are the four kind of common characteristics, and these are largely created by the management uh, themselves. And for the most part, uh, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, I think these are generally within the current capability of USPS. But every bit as important uh, to their success is the set of conditions that the governments of these posts have put in place uh, as, uh, as they have looked at their, at their posts and their futures. There are three critically important uh, conditions that they've, they tend to have in common. The legal framework within which they operate provides complete commercial freedom of action to operate in a competitive market. They operate very much like private entities do uh, in their country and in this country as well. The regulator in these countries usually has a light and a supporting hand, and their primary focus is generally on uni universal service issues, the reserved areas, and the generation of competition in their local postal markets. Third, there is little political interference in the basic business decisions that these posts make, provided the post operates within the legal framework they have been given. In my judgment, these are the fundamental success factors for, these po for those posts in virtually all aspects of their operations. And, of course, they generally have very solid leadership and a very effective governance structure at those posts. So what does this mean for USPS? Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I think there are two other important factors uh, to keep in mind in a discussion of revenue initiatives and the authority and the flexibility of USP that USPS has under the law. The first of these issues is scale. I do not want to discourage anyone, but the problem USPS faces today is measured in billions of dollars. Finding new sources of revenue for USPS is important, but think about it. A thousand projects worth a million dollars each will generate one billion dollars. Or make it ten projects worth a hundred million dollars. And that may not be enough. While the recent reform law provided some additional flexibility to the Postal Service, I frankly have not heard of any initiatives approaching anything like that. And I don't say that. To, to denigrate in any way what the, what the Postal Service and its uh, colleagues have tried to do. But to have a real impact in this area, 
It's going to take some different and some very big thinking. The second issue is every bit as challenging. Unlike most of the posts I have discussed today uh, here, uh, in the U.S. there is a very strong philosophical aversion to a government entity competing in private markets with goods and services that are already available from private sources. In the past, when USPS has attempted to offer such services, there has been very strong and noisy resistance, and eventually USPS hears from some of you. I have personally experienced that. <laughs> I do not see that situation changing simply because the postal revenue problem is bigger today. Now, given this latter challenge, whatever revenue initiatives the USPS undertakes outside the traditional postal arena will probably have to involve partnerships and alliances with private entities where both parties can leverage the strengths of the other. In the case of USPS, it has enormous geographic reach in its retail network, and they touch virtually every home in the country through their delivery network. Some of the opportunities might include expanded financial services availability, expanded delivery options, government and agency services, or a link between the physical presence of the USPS and emerging communications technologies and services. After hearing the Postmaster General's October 8th speech at the uh, National Press Club, I could imagine that some of the bankers in this country were bristling when the Postal Postmaster General answered a hypothetical question at his National Press Club speech about what new business he would like to be in by saying that he would like to be a bank. Well, instead of immediately thinking defensively. Mr. Coughlin, you need to wrap up. We are okay. way over on your time. Thank instead, you. Instead of thinking defensively, perhaps the bankers ought to put their innovation hats on and try to imagine how they could capitalize on what USPS has to offer. The same goes for other organizations looking for really new ways of engaging their customers. So what have we learned from foreign posts? Frankly, I think we have learned that what they are doing is interesting, but it is not terribly applicable to the USPS. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hare, welcome back. Right. You are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz, and members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to appear again before this subcommittee today to discuss the Postal Service's revenue generation initiatives. First, I will provide an update on the Postal Service's financial condition. Second, discuss revenue-related changes made by the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act of 2006, or PIAEA. Third, outline actions the Postal Service has taken to increase revenue since 2006. And fourth, discuss issues related to generating new postal revenues. Turning first to the Postal Service's preliminary financial results in fiscal year 2009 and going forward, mail volume declined about 28 billion pieces and revenue declined from about 75 billion to 68 billion dollars. Congressional action was required to reduce the Postal Service's mandated retiree health payment by $4 billion. Outstanding debt increased by $3 billion to $10.2 billion. At this pace, the Postal Service will reach its $15 billion statutory debt limit in fiscal year 2011. Further, deficits over $7 billion are predicted in fiscal years 2010 and 2011. With regard to revenue generation and key postal products, PIEA gave the service greater pricing flexibility, including for market dominant products that generate 88 percent of its revenues. Market dominant mail is generally subject to an inflationary price cap. Competitive products are not subject to a price cap, but each competitive product must cover its costs. PIEA prohibited the Postal Service from offering new non postal products and services. Turning to actions that the Postal Service has taken since PIEA was enacted, the service increased average rates for market dominant mail in 2008 and 2009 at virtually the maximum allowable under the price cap. This year, three targeted rate incentives were provided to stimulate mail volume. A summer sale was introduced for standard mail, and there is an ongoing fall sale for first class mail and an incentive program for saturation mail. For competitive products, there are annual rate increases for priority and express mail in 2008 and 2009, and the service introduced volume discounts for these types of mail as well as a priority flat rate box. The Postal Service has entered into about 90 contracts with large mailers for other competitive products that are generally volume based with provisions intended to lower its costs. With regard to generating increased revenues, 
the Postal Service has asked Congress to change the PIA restriction on offering new postal products so that it could move into areas such as banking, insurance, and non-postal retail services. We previously analyzed past Postal Service forays in the non-postal area, reporting that it lost nearly $85 million in the mid-90s on 19 new products, including electronic commerce services and a remittance processing business. In 2001, we reported that none of its electronic commerce initiatives were profitable and the management of these efforts was fragmented. The Postal Service's interest in moving into new business lines raises several fundamental questions. Should the Postal Service compete in areas where there are already private sector providers? Should antitrust and consumer protection laws apply equally to the Postal Service and its competitors? If the Postal Service were to compete in banking, insurance, and retail services, should it be subject to the same regulatory entities as its competitors? If the Postal Service used its 37,000 retail facilities to offer new non-postal services, would this provide an unfair competitive advantage? And how would non-postal activities be financed given the service's current debt levels? Would it be allowed to borrow at Treasury rates? In conclusion, we added the Postal Service to our high-risk list this past July, noting that it urgently needs to restructure to remain financially viable. Although it has used its pricing and product flexibility, results to date have been limited, in part linked to the economy. At this point, the Postal Service has no business plan that clearly details its proposals for entering new non-postal markets and what specific legislative changes would be needed. Generating new revenues from postal products and services appears more promising than venturing into potentially risky non-postal areas. At the same time, much work remains to reduce postal operational costs. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement, and I'm pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Reasonable, welcome. You are now recognized for five minutes. Could we ask you to put your microphone on and, and just pull yeah. a little Good bit? Good morning, toward. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Chaffetz. Pull a little, and members up a little Senate. bit. Perfect. Thank you. How is that? Uh, I, uh, in my statement, I, believe, I explain why I believe the Postal Service and the mailing community can become a source of, uh, a source of innovation and new re postal revenue through public-private partnerships that were encouraged by Congress in Section 1004 of the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. Today there is a broad consensus that bold action must be taken to reinvigorate the postal system. And fortunately, there are some real and tangible opportunities to create new value for postal customers. To be clear, let me offer a few examples that might be called enabling the last mile, extending democracy's reach, and promoting green routes. By enabling the last mile, I refer to the many opportunities that exist for putting technology in the hands of the letter carrier, in other words, on the doorstep of the postal consumer. One of the areas of greatest interest to mailers has been wanting to know where their mail is while it is en route to its destination. The USPS was seen as a black hole compared with FedEx and UPS who have invested billions to enable their higher end services to track and trace mail products. This is going to change imminently because the Postal Service is on the verge of creating a smart grid of intelligent mail services. Now we can go beyond the barcode and offer tracking technologies that have exciting possibilities for adding new value for customers. What is more, we can download applications to the scanner technology that is finally, within the last six months, in the hands of the letter carriers. Customers can realize new tangible benefits and, and new postal revenue can be created. But to make this happen, we need to collectively create an innovative enterprise of tests and trials and partnerships. A second broad theme that Chairman Ruth Goldway in particular has championed has been vote by mail. The Postal Service can do this and can provide many other government services as well. To be practical and secure, it will require connecting hard copy services to Internet services and that will necessitate partnerships. But the opportunity to expand the capacity of the Postal Service to continue to serve as democracy's agent is here. 
And third, there are opportunities for the Postal Service to again serve the nation by carrying parcels that today cause three and four trucks to travel the same route. We can reduce carbon emissions by creating green postal routes. This will take some re-engineering and perhaps some recognition under cap and trade, but there are new opportunities here if we seize them. In conclusion, I didn't invent these ideas. They came from the community, from the mailing community, from letter carriers who have said, why not? They come from creative mailers who have said, why can't we have a smart envelope? And from suppliers who have shown how to do it. To tap this creativity, mindsets that were established when the Internet was still a future vision have to be changed. To homegrown governmental Internet services, it is time to say, that was then, this is now. In the future, innovation is going to come through collaboration and partnership where the Postal Service does what it does best and where the private sector, through partnerships, provides Internet services and makes mail relevant to the consumer of the future. If we make the modern Postal Services relevant by connecting them to this multi-channel Internet marketplace, they will generate more mail. This is the real revenue opportunity in, in, entailed in what we are talking about here today. The coming years could be an exciting time of transformation or they could be a train wreck. The difference will be whether there is clear public policy guidance that can define the difference between the creative balance of what should be public and postal and what the private sector can do best. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Uh, I yield myself uh, five minutes for, for questions. Mr. Bernstock, I, I do appreciate your, your uh, honesty in your statement that we are not going to solve this on the revenue side alone. I, I think that that is apparent just by the numbers. We, in 2008, we saw mail volume go down uh, 9.5 billion pieces. And then in the fiscal year ending October 1, 2009, we saw it drop $26 billion. There is no way in, in the near term that we could turn the system around and, uh, and solve that problem by selling more greeting cards or, or any other service that, that we might be capable of doing right now. Um, and at the same time, we are a little bit disappointed up here uh, with the consolidation effort and the cost saving uh, side. Uh, it does not appear that uh, the original target of closing maybe 1,400 uh, facilities uh, is anywhere near probable. I think the post office has reduced its consolidation numbers to below 400 now and it won't nearly uh, capture the savings that we thought was, were possible. Uh, as well, the early uh, retirement uh, incentives, that are, well, not, not great incentives, but the programs themselves have not uh, glean the type of uh, utilization on the part of the employees. So we still have a lot of people that are, are resisting an early buyout. We still have a large workforce. Uh, understandably so. Those, those uh, workers, their 401ks are you know, cut in half, most of them, so they don't want to retire in an environment like this. Yet we face a situation where we need transformational leadership. We need, we need a, a truly uh, dynamic uh, change at the post office, the way we do business. And uh, there's, there's a saying that says that there's nothing more disruptive to the human condition than the pain of a new idea. And unfortunately, that's, that's what we're facing. And uh, look, I, I love my postal workers, and I'll be the first one to admit it. And I, I don't want to see layoffs. I don't want to see any of that. So I'm trying all these other measures to protect the employees because, quite frankly, when we grade the uh, consumer satisfaction, the customer satisfaction among the Federal agencies, the Post Office, because of the work of their clerks, because of the work of their, their uh, mail handlers, because of the work of their, their letter carriers that go to every home and business in America six days a week, by far, they are the highest rated Federal agency that we have in America today. They do the best job. So 
uh, I think it would be uh, a, a mistargeting of, of our problems to look at the, at the backs of our employees to try to, to solve this problem. So we need to, we need to ch change our structure. Uh, and, and I was wondering, you know, there have been a few things mentioned here today about allowing the post office through the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act to branch out into these other areas. And uh, I, I know that there's some apprehension in, in competing with the private sector. But there's some, some areas, uh, specifically my colleague, uh, Mr. Chaffetz, come up, came up with an idea about uh, the Postal Service uh, taking over major responsibilities from, from the Census. Now, the Post Office already, you know, through the mail handlers I'm, and, and, and the, uh, the letter carriers, they go into every home and business in America already. And that's basically what the Census does. It tracks the population uh, most effectively through those those home visits. Uh, have you looked at any of that? Uh, so it would be government taking over government work, but just doing it more efficiently uh, for the taxpayer. Have we looked at any of that, or uh, have we looked at, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Goway has mentioned the vote by mail. Have we looked at any of those? I know they're disruptive. I know uh, bureaucracies are not going to be uh, uh, satisfied with that, but uh, I think we have very limited choices. Have you looked at any of those type of uh, initiatives that might really transform what we're doing at the post office? Could you? I will master this eventually. All right. <laughs> Chairman, we've looked at, at everything you've said. We've looked at the fact that we have $6 billion in cost savings that came in this year and we're, we're looking to lose $7 billion, we're looking at the fact that mail has declined. And we're looking at both huge transformational revenue issues, as, as I said, $45 billion is what it would take to close the gap. We have some initiatives underway, and, and we've also looked very specifically at the initiatives you've identified. Um, on the census piece, um, my understanding is through the mail, 80 or 90 percent of census responses come in, and while it's not within my um, area of responsibility. I do understand that there was a report by our operations team meeting with the Census Bureau which said that for going back and knocking on doors six or seven or eight times to get that last five percent, we may not be the best suited agency, but we are willing to, to relook at that. Vote by mail, we are very actively looking at a range of ways we can do that and have a series of initiatives underway. Okay, I have exhausted my time, so I'm going to yield to the ranking member for five minutes. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I, uh, Mr. Herr, I, um, has there been any sort of analysis, or any of you actually could answer this, is there, you know, the one, the one area we can point to where there's some cross-functionality within the government is the, is the passports. Is that a revenue generator? Is it just a break-even type of operation? Has there been any sort of analysis that says, boy, that was a good idea? We have not done that analysis. I, Mr. Bernstock, perhaps, you know, may have Ms. Goldwyn. Ms. Goldwyn. The, the Commission has done the analysis, and there it is a, a, a it provides, a, it not only breaks even, but it provides a contribution to overhead. So, it, in, in fact, it would make a profit for the Postal Service. It does, it is a successful re revenue generation tool. All right. So, I, I want to hear some ideas here. So, I, I like the one about the, the, uh, uh, that you mentioned about the national park passes and that sort of thing. That's that's not going to get us out of the financial hole that we're in. But what are the big ideas that are floating out there? And I, I just want to express again the sincere reluctance to get into areas where the private sector is already competing. The financial services, the telecom stuff, I, I can't imagine being supportive of that. Just I'm just being as candid as I can because there you have those services in the marketplace. But if we look at state and local government, if we look at federal government, if we look at our constitutional duties, roles, and responsibilities, it seems to me there are a number of agencies that would benefit by the sheer structure and magnitude of the workforce um, above and beyond what we've creatively thought up today. Con Congressman, I agree with that statement. And um, we do have the authority to provide credentialing and enrollment services to federal agencies. If we extended that authority to state and local agencies, I think we could do even more and, and 
How do many something. are you doing at the, at the federal level? Who, give me a better sense of. Well, the, the passport, the enrollment process on right. the passport is one active business we're engaged in. We feel that we could partner with a whole range of federal agencies, be it TSA or Social Security um, or agriculture. There's a number of ways we can do credentialing and enrollment work. Is there like a list of these out there? Are we pursue. We're we actively these types of engaged with several federal. Can you agencies. give me some more specifics about which ones you're pursuing or which um, ones? You're I don't have that data with me, but I can get it get it for you for the record. Did you? I'm sorry. Did you want to add something to that, Ms. Gold? Uh, I. Th I'm very gratified that the P Postal Service is now beginning to look at this area because it is potentially a great uh, a resource and uh, a great source of stability for the local post offices in the community. One of the issues that came up in a hearing we had recently is that while the post office itself may not generate a lot of revenue, having a post office in a local community shopping center creates revenue and economic development activity for the rest of the community around it. So it's important, I think, for the, over, uh, for the well-being of the economy overall to continue to support yeah, post I, offices. I agree. We're just and, looking and for these, real specifics these here. abilities to connect with local government will provide uh, at least enough revenue to, to continue to justify the service, if not solve the entire problem. Mr. Reesner, do you, if you had to come up with a list of the best three, four ideas that you've seen or heard out there, what, what would be on that list specifically? Well, it, it, the, the biggest thing of all, and, and I think that uh, Mr. Bernstock just talked for a, min a minute ago about the credentialing services. The, the idea that government to government services are something that the Postal Service can do and is encouraged to do under the law offers a platform for coming up with other creative ideas. I, I think the most important thing is that the marketplace bring the Postal Service the ideas, but that the Postal Service has, as Mr. Coughlin just talked about, become an innovative place where people have the sense that they can come and plug and play and try ideas and test their ideas in the marketplace to the benefit of postal customers. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would definitely echo that. If, I would like to, to put out a call to the private sector to say, please come to our rescue here. We, we need the creative innovation that's going to come from the, the populace across the, this country with the creative, innovative ideas that are going to be those big ideas that, uh, that the Postal Service can participate in, at the same time making sure we don't overly step into the private sector where, where rightfully the private sector should be leading the charge. But there are credentialing services and, and we need to continue to explore those ideas. I tend to think that the, the private sector is going to help come up with those ideas bigger and broader. So please, if you have those ideas, send them to us. We need them. And uh, I see I'm out of time. I'm getting ready to, I'm going to be under time this time, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to note that. Oh, shoot, I blew it. All right, bye. Well done. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Davis is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, I try to be as optimistic as possible. And as I listened to the witnesses, I thought of the baseball game that I was watching last night, uh, especially when the score got to be 7-1. to one. And I was wondering if there was any way that Philadelphia was going to get back. And I thought, you know, if you bunt, get a guy on first base, you bunt again, get another one on second base, that is, you come up with a number of different ideas, but they all kind of small in terms of generating the big runs that you really needed. And so when I think of changing prices for shipping services, uh, bring down the cost, reorganize sales, um, become more competitive, I guess I'm thinking reorganize sales to sell what, you know, other than stamps and shipping? Or if you've got some of the other services, is there any way that you can really be competitive or as competitive as you need to be? And so, Ms. Goldway, I'm thinking that eventually you get down to this last resort business. And 
I wanted to ask, what would you consider to be last resort in terms of being forced to cut services? Uh, when would last resort come? If, if you are uh, uh, the, the Commission has a process for making these decisions and it involves hearing from the public and getting a whole range of information about costs and benefits before we would make such a decision. Uh, certainly the Postal Service has brought forward to us an end case where we are looking at the po possibility of closing some post, post offices and they have suggested that they may bring another case about reducing service from six to five day delivery. There is not agreement yet on what the cost savings would be to close post offices and there is certainly no agreement yet on what the cost savings would be to reduce uh, service from six to five days. And the trade-off between reducing service and reduction in potential volume is something that needs to be looked at. If you cut service, do you reduce demand more than you would if you maintain service? I think it is a, a very complicated matter. And, and what I think our Commission's responsibility to do is to focus on what the PAE tells us, which is to assure uh, an efficient and effective postal service that provides universal service. So we would have to look at the, those trade-offs. Uh, I, I may be more of an optimist than you. Um, I'm a Dodger, a Brooklyn Dodger <laughs> fan, you know, I, and I've survived. Uh, I, I think that um, incremental uh, support can make a difference and that um, there are many surprising things that develop in the Postal Service. Uh, Netflix, for instance, is, a, is one that, at least for a time, is bringing us in a significant amount of revenue. And there may be others that develop as well. I certainly hope so. Well, thank you very much. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate the efforts and the creative thinking that uh, the Postal Service has put forth. I just don't want Casey at the bat. Um, Mr. Coughlin, let me ask you, because I, I listened uh, closely to, to your testimony. <laughs> what or do you have a prognosis under which we can really pull this out and pull it off? Well, that is the $68 billion question, I think. Uh, the, uh, let me just say I am uh, not quite perhaps as big an optimist as, uh, as uh, Chairman Goldway about the, uh, the future of mail volume. Uh, the, uh, I do think it is going to continue to slide. I think the, the short term, relatively short term options the Postal Service has on the cost side are fairly evident. They have pretty much been talked about. Uh, I think they, they need to reduce the number of uh, delivery days. I think we are one of the few countries in the world that still has six day delivery. Uh, I think they need to reduce the size of their processing network uh, from around 300 processing facilities to perhaps half of that size. Uh, and I think they need to reduce the size of their retail network. Uh, those are, I think, some obvious moves. And I know that they are difficult. Uh, they are not uh, changes that are going to go down easily. And they have some costs associated with them as well as some savings. Uh, I'd, I think the Postal Service itself needs to think in terms of what would a 400,000 person Postal Service look like and how would you operate and, and still deliver uh, on the universal service obligation because I think that is, in my judgment, that is probably where it is going to go. Uh, you need to continue to work on, on the revenue uh, issues that have been discussed. Uh, the, uh, the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, talked about uh, uh, the ideas that are generated from here, uh, what I would really encourage, I would encourage on the one hand the Postal Service to, to get out there and sell the, the obvious benefits of the Postal Service in terms of its ubiquity and its geographic reach to potential partners out there. But I would also, I mean, I see bank, new bank branches going up constantly in growing neighborhoods uh, out there, new brick and mortar. And I would have to ask myself as a banker, is there a possibility to partnership, to partner with an organization like the Postal Service uh, to provide financial services? 
uh, uh, agency services, all kinds of uh, ish, uh, opportunities are out there. It gets complicated, I think, partly by the way that, that the federal government is organized and the way its uh, funding uh, processes work in terms of the subparts of agencies. So that makes it complicated to, to kind of get an overall view of how, a, how an agency delivers services and how it might tap into the Postal Service. But uh, there are a lot of opportunities out there. I hope I'm wrong. But I think that's the direction it's going. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, for five minutes. Who yields to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, for five minutes. I thank my colleagues. <clears throat> you know, it's, it, uh, listening to all of the hearings we've had on this subject, we, <clears throat> we are clearly in search uh, as we move forward in this century uh, for a new viable business model for the U.S. Postal Service. And on the one hand, I think we in Congress maybe want to have it both ways. On the one hand, we recognize the iconic value of the post office in a given community. Its centrality in especially smaller rural parts of our country and we don't want that to change. We don't want you closing offices. We don't want you changing routes. We don't want you, you know, s cutting back on service or the numbers of days of service. And on the other, and oh, by the way, we don't want you unnecessarily competing with the private sector for anything. On the other hand, why aren't you viable? Why are you losing money? Why aren't you making money? Why aren't you like your competitors? And we in Congress can't have it both ways. We're going to have to work with you to recognize that by statute, uh, and, and Mr. Hare, I'd, I'd be interested in listening to your testimony. I think one of the things we have to talk about, you know, should the post office be subject to the same regulations as the private sector? Well, but by statute, we put some requirements on the Postal Service, don't we, that we don't put on the private sector that I think significantly circumscribes the ability of the post office to, to sort of break out here and just just be a, a, a rational actor in the, in the private market. I, I, uh, I'd agree with that. I think uh, part of it is we're just simply trying to pose some questions that uh, folks in your situation should be considering as you take a look at this. It's a large enterprise. It touches everyone's life uh, six days a week. I mean, as, as Chairman Lynch mentioned at the uh, opening, you know, no other institution does that six days a week. And uh, but to as you proceed with thinking about this, some of those trade-offs, those, those get raised, and I think it's important to keep them on the table as folks consider them, because if we don't raise them now, they'll come up later. Yeah. Okay. I would just add to your list, though, I think you have an obligation, GAO, to look at the statutory limitations or expectations we put on the Postal Service that make it different than an entity in the private sector. Well, and, and on that point, we have ongoing work looking at the Postal Service business model, and as part of that, we're factoring those kind of things into it as well. So, thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Reisner, how could the Postal Service incorporate, uh, uh, let's say, this banking, the, the, the banking idea that Ms. Goldway talked about without threatening community banks? Well, I think that, that Mr. Coughlin just uh, uh, really talked about it a, a second ago, that I think that there has to be a process that creates some kind of partnership in which the private sector gets to do what it does best. This is the marketplace that we live in today. I, I Just one quick point that I'd make, too, that, that I think Jack Potter the other day in his speech at the National Press Club created this framework and, and embraced something that Ruth Goldway had endorsed, which was looking out to the future 10 years and trying to imagine what kind of a postal service should we have to serve the public purposes that we see 10 years from now. And I, I, I can't look out 10 years and not imagine that the Internet isn't a part of the marketplace at that time. Now, is it appropriate for the postal service to provide those services? Probably not. And so finding partnerships where the public sector can be compensated for its retail presence and its ubiquity and the private sector can provide what it provides best, it seems to me, is part of that 10-year vision. What, uh, Ms. Goway, what do we know about, and, and anyone else, but what do we know about the elasticity of demand for the price of stamps? 
I mean, is, is there, is the demand inelastic such that we can raise the price to whatever we need to raise, or do we see significant fall off in volume every time we, in fact, raise the price? Well, we have about uh, 40 years of uh, following the Ms. prices. Goh I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Oh, we, we have about 40, in the Commission, we have about 40 years of following what we call the elasticity of price at first class mail. And for pretty much all that time, we could say it was inelastic. You raise the price and price sales might drop off a little, but they'd come back up. And that uh, stamp usage followed uh, the rate of population growth and to some degree the economy all through that time. But things really seem to have changed in the last four or five years. And there was uh, a slow but uh, steady decrease in the first class mail. Uh, and it has been greatly ex uh, increased by, the, um, by this recession. And the dilemma for all of us is to see whether the recession was an unusual event because after there was a great drop off in, in mail after 9-11, but it picked right back up again. Or, or is this a, 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 you know, a lasting phenomenon? I think all of us feel that the, uh, the growth of the Internet makes the role of mail very different from what it may have been in the past, and that we are all trying to find ways to make the mail relevant and valuable. So it may not be that we sell as many stamps, but what we sell is more valuable people are willing to pay for more for it, or there is some other way in which the community supports it. Uh, some of the European posts have subsidies for, for their mail or specific subsidies for post offices. It's, uh, and in fact, even those that have had great profits in the last few years are having real problems under this recession as well. So uh, just assuming that you can follow a European model where there is privatization will get you some uh, ongoing permanent independent post office is not assured either. Mr. Chairman, my uh, time has expired and I thank you. I do think Ms. Goldway's answer underscores, and I thank you for it, underscores the fact that moving forward we can't just tinker at the edges. We have got to figure out a new business model that is going to work. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. The uh, Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I am uh, I'm grateful that under your leadership, this committee continues to look at what we can do to uh, secure universal service to the people of the United States. In my neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio, I have seen over the last few years uh, the post boxes disappear from neighborhoods. And I don't take that lightly because to me that is, has been an essential part of the infrastructure of postal service. Now, the next part of the infrastructure of postal service are the branches. And of course, we know that, uh, uh, that the Postal Administration has been systematically targeting branches, particularly in, uh, in areas which are economically disadvantaged. Think about universal service. And we know they're cutting hours keep trying to downsize this postal service. Now, at the same time, there has been an expansion of, uh, of dealings with the private sector, the private sector take over uh, more and more. Now, I think we need to look long and hard about this uh, creeping privatization that has been going on in the postal service because it's really at odds with universal service. It's if, if the postal service is a money loser, why does the private sector want to take it over? Think about that. If, it's, if it loses money, why would anyone want to take it over or even turn it into a bank if it's such a money loser? This service belongs to the people of the United States. Now, I have, uh, and while certainly every business model needs to be updated, privatization is not updating the business model of the Postal Service, it's destroying the Postal Service. Now, I have a question for uh, Chairman uh, Goldway. Welcome to this committee, Chairman. 
Your testimony echoes my concern that in diversifying the services the United States Postal Service provides, plans to move forward with providing non-postal related services could lead to a reduction in essential services traditionally provided by the Post Office and could subordinate the provision of these services to the pursuit of revenue. Much of the United States Postal Service airmail has already been outsourced to FedEx. Can you please explain or, and can you expand on the Postal Regulatory Commission's concerns regarding cuts in essential services until revenue generation plans have been successfully implemented? And is the, is the Commission concerned that moving away from traditional services could lead to the privatization of the core services the Post Office is mandated, mandated to provide? If you could respond. Thank you, Congressman Kucinich. Uh, both of us uh, met each other uh, thirty some odd years ago when we were mayors of speak, our cities. I, I'm sorry, Ma Madam Bo Chair. Both if you of could us speak uh, first first met each other when we were mayors of our respective cities about thirty years ago. So we share this focus on the local impact of the postal service. I think. Uh, I'm. I don't think the commission is opposed to the postal service uh, providing non-postal services. Uh, and uh, we, uh, our litmus test is that we, we expect the services to be in support of the mail function. So greeting cards are fine. Uh, money orders that the Postal Service has provided and even electronic money orders internationally are fine. Uh, copying services are fine. There's a range of services that are, that are fine. And, and we are certainly open to the Postal Service coming up with any number of experimental products, should they have them, that are related to, to Postal Services that we could define as Postal Service. So we're, we're, we actively support and, and look forward to the Postal Service coming forward with those new ideas. And I think our record is that we, we accept uh, almost all of them. Um, the problem is, if, if you look at the Postal Service and its network, the retail clerks that are there are, are paid very high wages, and I think they should be. But look at the bank next door and the wages that are paid to, to the, the bank next door. It's, it's not likely that a bank is going to want to partner with the Postal Service unless there's some real change in wage well, structure, well, which, which, which may, may result in uh, I, I would, problems I would, I would as well. So all of these if I may, uh, my, my time is expiring, and Sorry. I would just uh, uh, like to make this observation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, concluding, if, uh, if banks want to partner with post offices, the only reason they'd want to do that is so they could take over the post offices, so that people then have to do their postal business through banking. I mean, this is very easy to see. These things go either way. You can't, you know, we used to be able to go to uh, banks and pay bills. Then they stopped doing that, okay? It's easy for them to take up the function of mailing and then just take it, take it over from the government. We already had enough experience with, uh, uh, with the workings of banks here to know that uh, if, if, if banks, uh, we're looking to the private sector to provide solutions for government services, we're probably looking in the wrong place. I thank the gentleman. Uh, just briefly, I'm going to yield myself t uh, 15 seconds. I think what's happening here, though, is, is that now we see a model out there, a competitive model. When I go to the stop and shop, or uh, you go to the Piggly Wiggly <coughs> to, to do your shopping, there's a bank there, there's uh, all kinds of different things offered. So I think the, the Postal Service is under that similar pressure as well. But uh, I'll, I'll wait till I have five minutes to expound on that a little further. But I, I, I deeply uh, appreciate the gentleman's comments, and I, and I agree with the threat that he's identified. Uh, at this point, I'd like to also uh, welcome uh, former Representative William Clay. Uh, thank you very much, sir. We appreciate uh, your attendance. Uh, just in time to hear from your son, uh, the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Clay, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for conducting this hearing today. Like all of us, I am uh, deeply invested uh, in the success of the Postal Service, and I'm happy we have continued to think critically about uh, ensuring a positive future for the USPS. Also, let me uh, welcome my panel uh, to these proceedings, and I thank you for being here uh, to share your expertise. Uh, also, is, uh, uh, as the chairman mentioned, my, uh, my older brother is in the front row, too, so we welcome him also. Uh, let me uh, 
Let me start off by, by saying uh, much of, of your recent effort uh, has gone towards innovation in new markets. Uh, is there any value in expanding existing postal services to increase revenue uh, and customer loyalty? And, and, and anybody can take a shot at it. Uh, Ms. Galway? Sure. I, I think, um, Congressman Clay, there, there's a balance between driving down costs and growing revenue. And, and I think the, the tension starts with the fact that, once again, this year, we had six billion dollars in cost savings and we did a little bit of research we think that's the single largest cost savings by any company in this country possibly ever yet we lost seven billion dollars so on all the revenue generating initiatives that we're pursuing within the law clearly contribute but when you have a loss of that mag magnitude you can't get back to a stable post office or postal service without some changes in, in, in the cost savings initiatives that are not within the law at the current time. Um, how about, it, had, has there been any effort to uh, strengthen um, the, the services such as first class mail? At the current time we're running a um, fall um, first class um, incentive program and the impact of that we estimate will be fifty million dollars, a hundred million dollars in incremental revenue in that ballpark. But once again, in comparison to a seven billion dollar loss, it's rel it's relatively modest in, in the impact. So there are things we're doing. Um, elasticity, as Chairman Goldway pointed out, is increasing, both from c consumers and commercial mailers, and so we're fighting a very, very difficult uphill battle. Well, it I guess that uh, begs the question then, how can the USPS carve out their own niche uh, in the postal market and continue to differentiate itself from other mail services? Well, as, as many of the panelists have said and, and uh, as we've heard, we have an enormous number of strengths, um, be it our infrastructure, our retail infrastructure, our delivery capabilities, our logistics capability, the fact that we're number one in trust. Uh, our, all of, of the strengths that we have should be leveraged. What we need to do is have more freedom to expand our model as this country changes and, and build on the strengths that we have. You know, you, uh, you cite examples in uh, international markets as evidence that USPS should include other services for customers. Uh, how successful have these efforts been internationally? Do they turn a profit or do they break even? Yes, yeah, uh, I think perhaps Mr. Coughlin can answer. Uh, well, I will comment on. I do uh, list in my written statement some of the, the results they've had. They've, some of these uh, posts have uh, generated as much as 75 percent uh, of their total revenues from non-postal sources. Deutsche Post, for example, in Germany. Uh, is an example. The, the Dutch Postal Service, TNT, is generating 60 percent. But they have undertaken major, major diversification. Uh, the, uh, the Germans, for example, have, have bought heavily into the, uh, to the logistics business. Uh, they've, they've made some several billion, multi-billion euro acquisitions to get into that business. Uh, they, they've had, to be perfectly honest, although they show uh, profits for the most part. They have, as Chairman Goldway said, they're having a little trouble right now with the fall in, uh, in, uh, in mail. Uh, and the interesting thing about the Germans is they've, they're getting 75 percent of their revenues from non-postal sources, but they're getting 50 percent or more of their profits from mail. Uh, so mail's still a pretty good business for those, uh, those people. So the, the, to call them a success, yeah, there are some success stories, but some are not doing quite as well as they look like they are on the surface. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, one of the things that I worry about, I yield myself five minutes, uh, one of the things that I worry about is that, uh, you know, that old adage that uh, just like our military, we tend to fight the last war. And now, now the things that we're looking at, as Mr. Connolly has described as being nibbling around the edges, uh, I look out there and uh, 
you look at some of these other countries, uh, as Mr. Coughlin has noted, uh, Sweden has a system where you actually click on and you can see your mail. And uh, you can click on, you can actually read some of it, uh, you know, the uh, uh, pamphlets or brochures or whatever that come to your house. You can click on whether you want to have it delivered or not. You know, and, and that's a great environmental uh, benefit, I think, in the long run, but it's going to drop the volume of mail. But I, I think that's, that's really the future. And, and, and so I don't want to get caught up in addressing the, the things that we see now, but I'd rather us try to anticipate as a, as a commercial business would what's coming down the line. I also see some of the, even our domestic uh, models like, uh, you know, Earth Class Mail and, and Zoombox, where it's a similar Internet-based uh, or Internet-centered uh, system. And I just think we, we have to really, really uh, uh, think, think long term here. Uh, there was a book out, it's an older book, uh, The World is Flat by Tom Friedman. And he has one chapter there on UPS. I know my friends from UPS are in the back there. But uh, he gave the example of uh, Toshiba uh, Computer Company. Uh, they used to have, they had a, a warranty on their, their laptop computers where is if anything happened, you just mail it back to Japan and they would, they would fix it and send it back to you within a certain amount of days. And uh, well, UPS, uh, as it describes in this story, uh, turned that all around to the fact where uh, instead of the user just sending their laptop to Atlanta and then off to Japan to be fixed, UPS put their own people to work repairing those computers. And uh, that is totally outside of the delivery uh, business. They now became computer fixers, and they would save the Toshiba company a ton of money and uh, make their customers happier. So, you know, it's that type of innovation and, uh, you know, just uh, transformative change that, that we need in the Postal Service. And I know it's, it's frightening, uh, and I know that uh, bureaucracies uh, are even more resistant to change, but I, I just see with the drop off in volume, what we see coming down the line, uh, <clears throat> I see the number of retirees we have in our postal system. Uh, we have to have a business model that allows us to continue to provide those benefits to retirees. So we're going to fall off a cliff here if we don't get our business model matched up with the realities that we have here. So we really, really, I know there may be some short-term disruption here, but, uh, you know, we just encourage you to, to take that chance to think big. Think big. This is a big problem. So the, uh, you know, the response here has to be, as I say, transformative. We have to look at this in a different way than just, you know, nibbling around the edges and trying to bring in a, you know, uh, a few more million in, in, in revenues. So, uh, again, you know, do you have anything like that, that, uh, you know, some, some big moves that would, would help us uh, take a bite out of the, the, uh, Chairman, the deficit that we see? Chairman Lynch, I speak for the Postal Service and we fully agree with what you're saying. We are 5 percent of the world's population and 40 percent of the world's mail. We have been the world's innovator in hard copy mail. And what's frustrating is we believe we have the same kind of role to play within digital communication. It's hard for us to look at Sweden leading the U.S. We believe we should be out in front of the, the, the technology changes that are occurring, not for any other reason than to foster commerce and to be a market maker and to have the result be that the United States is a leader in this transformation to digital products and that we offer hybrid products. So I think without these kinds of transformational moves in concert with, you know, the, the cost savings we've talked about, we can have a thriving, growing postal service. Uh, I'd just Madam like Chair? to add that um, the postal service has presented hybrid mail products to us in the past, and we've approved them. Uh, mailing online and post ECS were both approved by the Postal Regulatory Commission, Postal Rate Commission at the time. It was the Postal Service that found that they could not uh, implement those programs. They, they weren't up to the task. Now, if, if there's some partnership that they can develop, uh, I think the Postal Regulatory Commission would certainly review that. I'm not sure that <coughs> 
there's any need for new legislation, uh, we'd be interested in looking at those issues. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking of it this way. You know, you, you see what Walmart and, and these, you know, Stop and Shop and Piggly Wiggly and uh, Harris Teeter, you know, these big, uh, big box uh, stores have done is they didn't try to recreate their own bank. They didn't try to recreate their own uh, mail facility. They brought the post office in. They brought, you know, they brought uh, the banks in. Uh, they've used the, I mean, think when you think about our scale, as Mr. Coughlin has, has outlined, that's also an advantage if we use it the right way, use that as leverage. And uh, we have 37,000 post offices out there. And uh, so we own the footprint. And what we put in there, and it may be, you know, I'm not suggesting go out there and start the U.S. Postal Bank, but can we bring in other services within the footprint of the, the postal uh, facility to offer more than what we're offering right now and have that entity, that private entity, uh, you know, pay some of the freight there since we're already, we already own a lot of these facilities, although I'm surprised to see how much we're still leasing. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I'm just trying to multiply our competitive advantage uh, where, where we can. Mr. Bernstock? Yeah, I, Chairman Lynch, the greeting card um, test that we're running now is a very good indicator of what you're talking about. Before we went out and launched that, we went to, to consumers, and the feedback was that, that, yes, they would be very pleased to have greeting cards offered in the Postal Service. They thought it was appropriate and they would expect to purchase them there. So there's a whole range of other products that we could sell that we actually think would grow the market and our customers would want those. In addition, beyond passports, we think there's a whole series of transactional um, activities we can be involved in. So I would agree there's a, a, a lot more we can do with the facilities that we have. Yeah, I, I guess, and I appreciate that, and I know change is difficult. Some, some would require changes in the law, some would not. Okay. Well, we're happy to work with you and work with the postal employees as well to see what we can do. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I certainly agree that we've got to think big. I think part of the problem, though, is we don't think we'll like the answers that we get. Uh, it's kind of like everybody want to go to heaven, but <laughs> nobody wants to die. <laughs> and when I think of cost, I mean, we generate at one location, but then we spend at another one. I, I, I mean, we generate as people come in to purchase whatever it is that they're purchasing, but the output is as we maintain or try to maintain the concept of universal service. I know it's difficult to receive a piece of first class mail, for example, if you live out on P.O. Box, like I used to live, um, you know, where the carrier would go five miles before delivering another piece of mail. Well, I don't know how much you generate from the post office, you know, as you sell whatever product you are selling. It seems to me that we've had some experiences and continue to have some experiences with bailouts. Uh, we've put resources into places. I think we have to do some serious thinking in relationship to what it is that we expect. I really don't want to have cancer and have somebody tell me I've got a sore. I don't want to have pneumonia. And somebody have me believing or thinking that I've just got a cough. You know, I got a little cold. So 
I agree that there are no shortcuts or easy routes or easy ways home. But I do think we're going to have to go for the big picture in terms of reevaluating our thinking relative to what it is that we want from our postal service. I never will forget a guy made a speech when I was in the eighth grade. He came to our school. And he said, I want you to ask yourselves three questions. One, who am I? Two, what do I want? And three, how do I propose to get it? And I think we're going to have to ask ourselves those three questions about our postal service. I'm a staunch union supporter, always have been, always will be. I believe that people should get the maximum of what can be received in terms of quality of life and expectation. But I also believe that there has to be realistic thinking in relationship to how do we manage a way to do that. If anyone would respond, I would appreciate it. If not, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for the opportunity. I know that have they just signaled votes? They have. What I'd like to do is recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, for five minutes. I thank the chair. Um, Mr. Coughlin, I wonder, do you believe that the USPS has a culture of innovation? <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> if not, why not? I think it has pockets of innovation, Mr. Chair. And I'm gonna, again, I'm going to ask everyone, please, speak into the microphone. It's, I cannot hear you, believe it or not, up here. Uh, I believe there are pockets of innovation within the, the Postal Service. Uh, uh, I do believe that there are some conditions that exist. Uh, and I, I will say I, I don't think it's unique to the Postal Service. I think it's, it's a characteristic of government generally that discourage risk-taking uh, and discourage innovation. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they don't, and it doesn't generate a, an environment where innovation is expected on the part of employees. Or uh, rewarded. I'm sorry? Or rewarded, perhaps. It, well, that's a difficult issue as yeah. well, uh, rewarded. But, uh, I mean, I spent 32 years there. I think it's the greatest workforce in the world. Uh, there are an, some enormously creative people there, uh, and uh, they're going to need all of that creativity as they go forward. Uh, I do believe that Jack Potter and his team have done a terrific job in terms of generating an environment that encourages people to come forward with with uh, new ideas. And the, just the, 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 the move of bringing in people like Bob Bernstock and some of his colleagues to help support the traditional postal thinking has got to help in the long run. And I would, to go back to some of the, the chairman's comments earlier about the future, uh, I wish I had an answer to what that business model ought to be. I don't right now. I do think that these things evolve over time. One of the things I mentioned in my testimony was uh, I, do, I believe one of the possibilities is for the Postal Service down the road is in this nexus between their, their geographic physical presence and the communications technologies that are out there. And I think that's some of what, for example, the, the Swedish example you mentioned gets to. Uh, so, uh, yes and no is the answer to your question about innovation in the Postal Service. Uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Goway, uh, you intriguingly noted that the Post Office fleet is one of the largest in the country and that in some ways, given the route structure, it's tailor-made for electrification and sort of talk about innovation, cutting edge green technology being deployed. Uh, could you expand a little bit on that? Bec have, have we done any studies that show how many pounds of CO2 and noxious gases could be uh, avoided, uh, what the energy savings could be? Uh, th this is an issue I ventured into uh, uh, just in uh, January of this year, and uh, I've discovered that there's a, a whole range of expertise far greater than mine 
I, I do have many studies that I can forward to you about this. It, it appears that the Postal Service is ideally suited for transition to an electric vehicle fleet. Uh, its current vehicles get about 8 to 12 miles to the gallon, and they are all at, at least 18 years old. Uh, unfortunately, given the financial reality of the Postal Service, they don't have the capital Can to I buy new vehicles. And, and I think it would be worthwhile to find funds in some of the other subsidies that are provided through the government and have those directed to the Postal Service so that they could invest in new vehicles, reduce some of their overhead, and, uh, and lead the country in, uh, in a, a national transformation. Let me ask you, because uh, I think we are into something here. How, how many vehicles in the fleet? Uh, 150,000, although I think there may be a maybe 140,000 now. They have reduced them a bit. And uh, any idea of what it would cost to replace them with electric vehicles? Well, what, we're, what I think the thinking is, and I believe that Congressman Serrano is working on some legislation, is to, to develop a program so that you phase in over uh, three to five years enough vehicles with enough uh, tech testing that you know exactly what to buy. Uh, but it's billions of dollars uh, yeah. that, that are needed. I, I, my time is about to expire, but I, I, I just want to pick up on your thought. It seems to me, Mr. Chairman, again, uh, both Mr. Coughlin's, uh, where he was pointing us to, we legislatively can look at how we can try to help foster a more innovative culture. We may be part of the problem. Secondly, um, with respect to what Chairwoman Goway is talking about, uh, we were willing to put a lot, billions of dollars into cash for clunkers. Are we willing to invest in our own postal service to give it that cutting edge, innovative, a delivery of services to help make it more competitive, to give it the capital it lacks right now, and to do a good thing for the environment and for the auto industry while we are at it. I think all of us on the table would support that effort and work with you to, to make sure that happens. Thank you so much. I thank the gentleman. I think this panel has suffered enough. Uh, we have actually got votes on the floor, but I did want to thank you for your willingness to come before the subcommittee and, and offer your your thoughts and uh, suggestions. We, we appreciate that. Uh, you are on the ground level where you can uh, offer a unique perspective. Uh, I will hold the record open. I know there were several hearings going on this morning so that my Republican colleagues could not all attend, so I will leave the record open for their comments as well. But I want to thank you for your willingness to come forward and to help the committee with its work. Thank you very much. I bid you a good day. Next on C-SPAN 2, a talk with Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman